Welcome to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast, where we share all things people stuff in leadership. Learn from leaders who have done the hard yards and learn from experience. Hear from expert authors about the latest insights from culture to strategy and messy people dynamics. Get tips and insights from multiple award-winning author and leadership expert herself, Zoe Routh. Now, on with the show. Hey, it's Zoe, your friendly neighborhood Australian-Canadian leadership expert. And we've been talking all this quarter around hybrid teams, hybrid working, remote working. And the question is, how are we going to do that properly? And there's issues that come up around trust, etc. But my guest today is helping us unpack some of the more important questions that supersede the how of doing remote and hybrid work and really thinking about the purpose of our businesses, the structure of our businesses. And if we start there, we can ask better questions and that can shape so much better how we actually do and if we do remote hybrid work. We had a far-reaching conversation which talked about Vikings, anything from Vikings through to innovation, through to the hybrid working environment. His name is Bruno Peschitz, and he is originally from Croatia and now works in Osho, (laughs) Oslo, works in Oslo, Norway. So I call him my Croatian Viking friend. And he is a master of innovation engineer by trade. He has written a brand new book called Augmented Strategy, which we talk a little about. And he's also an amazing innovator, and he has an award-winning board game, which we didn't talk about, but I'm going to take a look at, which is all about playing lean. It's called The Board Game. So he helps corporate experiences and corporate entrepreneurs innovate more effectively. So he's undertaking a doctorate in organizational change with a specific focus on the issues with innovation in large enterprises. He knows this stuff, and uh, I really look forward to sharing this interview with you. So without further ado, on with the show. Bruno Peschitz, welcome to the show all the way from Oslo, Norway. Hello, happy to be here with you. That's great. You know, I'm excited to speak to someone from Norway because I've been watching so many Viking shows. <laughs> I think, <laughs> you know, do those shows really resonate with you guys? Do you watch any of those Viking shows that are on Netflix right now? Well, I have to be honest, I'm not watching that many Viking shows, although I did watch them when they were coming out, you know, first season, second season, etc. Uh, but what I would suggest to anyone visiting Norway is uh, not just to go to Oslo, but try to go, you know, to Lofoten, Stavanger, other places in Norway, and you have these amazing Viking museums. So, for example, in Lofoten, uh, you have a whole village, you know, that you can visit. You can go on a on a Viking ship for a little bit of a sail. Uh, you have basically, uh, I don't want to say actors, but the people in museum are all dressed up, you know, like role playing. So it's not like you know traditional museum, but more like a living museum thingy. So it's it's pretty cool. And and of course, you know, media is always media. Some things didn't exist, but it doesn't matter. It's entertaining. <laughs> it is. It's really entertaining. I, I love that period of history and I love the Viking story. So, um, so yeah, welcome to the show, my Viking friend, Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> now, you weren't always a Viking, I'm sure. Uh, tell us about a little bit about how your origin story of how you got to be into innovation. Mm, yeah. So uh, by training, I'm actually an engineer, to be more precise, industrial engineer. And while I was studying, uh, I got involved with uh, Toyota because I was just fascinated on how to run manufacturing systems and how to run them smoother. When I finished my education, I was uh, one of the lucky persons that won scholarship and I started my career in uh, defense. I used to work, you know, on weapon systems, battle tanks, etc. And what I had there was a very difficult project with a group of engineers where basically a customer asked for something that he believed was physically impossible. And us being a young group of engineers, we took it very personally and we did our best to come up with that thing. And we succeeded. But what happened next is what was the turning point for me. Nobody wanted to buy it because nobody believed it was physically possible. And this is where I realized that, hey, innovation isn't really just about product development. It's also about marketing, sales, positioning, human side, how do we talk about value? How do we perceive value? 
how do we run organizations and etc and from there you know that was more than 10 years ago somehow i ended up traveling the world working with large organizations helping them innovate and settling here in norway so that's kind of in a nutshell all right so are you not originally from norway where are you from originally i'm originally from uh, croatia oh cool <laughs> yeah, yeah another beautiful place i agree i cannot disagree with that <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So that's a really interesting observation, you know, like you can have a brilliant idea, a brilliant design, but if nobody sees the value in it or doesn't believe in it, you, like I love that part of your story that the fact people are like, no, nah, there's no way that can work. And you're like, but, but it does. <laughs> How do you go about persuading people around like your product is actually a useful thing? Is it at the end of the process or is it at the beginning? Well, if you are in that position, you have already failed with the innovation process. That's one of my hard learnings. So kind of, it's always the worst position to be in, uh, looking for customer after you have developed the product. Kind of the best thing, the best practice in the innovation space is starting actually from the customer, from the existing need, from some existing behaviors, and then trying to match and overcome that instead of trying you know, to ask a group of engineers, what do you think is the most brilliant thing to do? Because I remember, I mean, when I was still working as engineer, we were always curious about the most technically advanced solution, not necessarily what would bring the most value or benefit to the customer. And that's why today I, I like to say the difference between invention and innovation is exactly the value component. So you can invent something new and radical and disruptive, but if it doesn't create value for the user, I don't call it innovation. You had your time, you invented something new and cool, but if no one is using it, haven't created value, sorry, <laughs> still not in the innovation space. And as you ask, what's the easiest way? <laughs> Start from the customer. Always need to understand the customer. And here there's uh, the popular, not dogma, but popular wording in the last 10, 15 years was kind of, and still is, love the problem, not the solution. And that's in the good direction. But if you look at a lot of popular products like iPhone, iPad, and the whole Apple line, if you want, it's not really satisfying specific problem, but specific set of desires, intentions, outcomes. Uh, the most valuable intelligence you can have about your customer base is how and what for are they actually using your product. So I know it's, it's an older example, but I love using it because it's a good example. When you say, you know, People don't get drills to have a drill. They get a drill to make a hole. Of course, where we need to make a difference is, are my customers handymen or are my customers, you know, regular people that just need to make a hole once a year? And then you start diverging and looking into it. So you cannot always use the same reasoning. But the idea behind the example is figure out how and what for are customers using your products and services if you understand that, you will be at better position to come up with products and services that they are more likely to buy. So you see, th there's a whole string of assumptions that don't necessarily always work out because innovation is never 100% guaranteed, but you're much better off than trying to come up with a product and then persuade people to purchase it. I'll, I'll just stop here for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. I'm trying to imagine working with a bunch of engineers and being told to stop being so smart on your own. And you actually have to get in the minds of people who aren't engineers. And, uh, you know, my dad's an engineer. So I say this with love. Engineers have a very set view of the world often. So you, you are one. So, you know, you've been through this path. How do you actually help technical people start to think about people? Because people are messy things, whereas, you know, engineering problems are intricate and complex in a very different way to people. So how do you get them engaged in the people stuff? Well, I can start from, from my side. So for me, as I said, that project was really the trigger to start looking into the, the whole broader ecosystem. In my experience, so yes, engineers are as you describe them, uh, but in my experience, it's often that it's just a lack of awareness, not, not really kind of uh, purposefully ignoring the end customer, but kind <laughs> of, you know, uh, give me my systems. I like designing them. I'll go to the shop floor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they work well with design requirements. So if you actually provide, hey, the customer actually would appreciate X, Y, and Z, 
most of the engineers in my experience will go, oh, that's easy. I, I, can, I can do that. That's the only thing they're asking for. So it's more like of framing and putting it in, in front of them. And everybody loves seeing their product used. And that is something where, in my experience, uh, companies go wrong or engineering having companies go wrong because they either don't allow or don't expose their engineering departments to the customer enough. Because usually in... I'm here talking about traditional manufacturing organizations where you will have R&D, product development, and operations. Usually, engineering will be before operations. So operations would be closer to the, let's say, customer than necessarily engineering department itself. What's important is to, to have this more integrated environment. And some easy things, before COVID at least, were trade fairs. You know, send your engineers to trade fairs. That's where actual buyers come, you know, handymen looking for new valves, uh, people looking for new freight trains. So you get your engineers exposed to actual buyers, not just the sales department. So it's I'm a big fan of pragmatic and easily implementable solutions. Yes, they're not a solution to 100% of the problems, but it gets you 80% of the way, which is quite significant chunk of improvement. That's good. One of the challenges that uh, some of my clients have, they're membership-based organizations and they get like, let's find out what the customer wants. And they'll ask the customer, what do you want from our association to make your membership more valuable? So it's like, you know, what do you want? And I think it, it speaks a little bit to that old adage that they talk about Henry Ford. If he'd asked his customers what they want, they would have said a faster horse. And it's getting beyond the faster horse to what the meaning is, I guess. But, you know, when it comes to like membership associations, if you've ever done any work with them, how do you get to people to actually identify the things that they want? Is there a particular way of asking questions to dig into that a bit? Absolutely. So uh, with all respect to membership organizations, the question you put forward is a traditional mistake done in innovation, etc. What do you want is a horrible question. And I'll explain why so that people can understand why. First, it asks them to imagine the future that doesn't exist. So they will be able to answer with things that they think they might want, but in reality would never actually pay for or use. So you, you're <laughs> asking them a future-oriented question that's extremely aspirational. Would you like to eat more healthy? Would you like to make more money? Would you like to have a better life? Why would I ever say no to that? So kind of, it's, it's a very dangerous question. What is better is asking a series of questions that are focused more on things like, how are you using your membership today? What does it help you achieve? When was the last time you used some of the membership perks? How did you use this membership perks? How did that work out? So kind of, you know, focusing on the things that have happened in the past and how they have happened in the past. Uh, what's especially interesting are past members. Why did you leave? How did you make the decision to leave? How did that impact, you know, your job, profession, whatever? The worst thing you, you can hear is, it didn't impact me at all. <laughs> then, then you have so, a, lot, a lot to work on, right? Yeah. But it, it's, it's all about this how, what, why type of questions, looking at the things that have happened. When we have that, then we can start kind of formulating, okay, th this is how it's actually benefiting them at the moment. And this is what they're trying to accomplish. So let's say, uh, I'm, I'm just imagining an example. I want to be part of trade association because it gives me opportunity to network. That's very high level. Then I would ask, okay, what do you mean by network? So what kind of network are you hoping to get into? What are you hoping to get out of that network? Can you please tell me more what does network mean to you? So I, I would keep drilling in. And whenever the potential member or actual member would say something, oh, I'm hoping to meet interesting people. Okay, what are interesting people to you? What If they would say, I hope to develop my skills. Okay, what specific skills? And I know this might sound, hey, we are a trade association of welders. Everybody here wants to be a better welder. Yes, go to the next level of detail. How? Where? Are they expecting training? Are they expecting tales from the trenches? Are they expecting discounts on their uh, welding certifications? You know, go to the next level of depth. So that is kind of with member associations. And especially member associations need to remember that most of their 
well, at least in Norway, my experience, not sure about Australia, most of their models are kind of subscription-based, annual-based, and uh, most of them in in European context, from my experience, I think adopted the wrong strategy of saying you're legally obliged to be part of the association in order to, to check something. So then everybody consider it to be kind of a tax on their profession. If we go back to what you asked me and I said innovation is about value. If you want to be innovative in your trade association, you should not focus on being a tax on profession, but adding value added services, advice, connections, whatever is important in your trade. Now, that's an amazing thing that you can assume people would be willing to pay for happily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's wonderful. So I'm just thinking about the conversation I had with one of my industry associations. Well, it was yesterday, actually. And they're doing the strategic planning at the moment. And they're thinking about how can we be of service to our members? And they sent out a survey, say, you know, what kinds of things can we do to improve your membership? And if they'd had your questions, that would have been heaps better. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, I want to comment on that as well, because uh, what I walked you through was uh, more of a qualitative, in-depth, open-ended conversation. Uh, Surveys can be very potent, but unfortunately are quite misused. So there is an open-ended survey and there is a survey that's more closed with a lot of leading questions. Would you like us to introduce A? Or uh, how satisfied are you with the, 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 the. Uh, These kind of things are good only if you know the questions, if you're very, very confident in your questions. So two question surveys that, that I quite like. So the first question is how important benefit A is for you? And then how satisfied with benefit A are you? So kind of uh, both are numerical scales. You know, you can use Likert, you can use whatever, one to 10, one to seven, one to five. I wouldn't suggest broader than that. And then for every benefit, both questions. Why both? So one question actually quantifies how important this benefit is to them. While the other question uh, quantifies how well met their need is. So if, if you ask, okay, Uh, benefit, access to specific network of welders. That benefit is five, very, very important to me. How satisfied are you with us allowing you access to specific type of welders? Two. So what that would signal is, okay, my members really, really care about this benefit, but we are not really delivering on that benefit. So that, that discrepancy and kind of going for each benefit like that. And it's also possible to snuck in kind of the things that you don't have right now. So benefits you're thinking about introducing, you could ask about them as well. And it would be problematic if they're, for example, if they're putting that it's very important and very well satisfied, that means that they are either getting that outside of your organization or are getting from your organization, but you're not aware of it. Is a marketing thing. If they put that something is very high importance and very poorly satisfied, that's the golden nugget. That's what you need to, to look into. And if something is very satisfied, but very low on importance, it's probably something that you should not pour a lot of money into. So they're happy if you don't have it in your marketing materials, include it, but otherwise uh, don't set up events around it or, or uh, specific trade fairs or etc. Okay. And um, just one thing you said in there, like use welders as an example. Do welders really want to hang out with other welders? <laughs> is, that, is that something, is that just an example or you know this to be true? Well, I mean, uh, when I used to work in uh, defense industry, welders like to ha- hang out together. I mean, uh, really? welding is, yeah, wel- welding is actually quite a standardized discipline. There's a, a lot of cool stuff there. And uh, it is one of those disciplines where Although there are now welding robots, there's still a lot of welds that are pretty much craftsman's like. So you, you still have that master apprentice dynamic happening. So th- that's that's why I guess they, they also have this benefit from hanging out because there is significant difference between someone who has been doing specific type of weld for 10, 15 years and between someone who just started, you know, two to three years ago. So there is this master apprentice journeyman dynamic. Thank you. That's really helpful. And I would be such a terrible welder. It would be all the seams would be lumpy and crap. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, so that's really useful in terms of getting at the front end of innovation and being really focused on the end user and digging into their needs and so on. You've got a new book out called Augmented Strategy. So tell us a little bit about what's going on with this book. What's it about? So uh, this book came out of a simple question. If you look at the one company like eBay, they generate more data in a single year than whole history of mankind up until that point. And they're just looking at one company like eBay, at Amazon, Alphabet, you know, Google, Facebook, etc. We have massive, 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 massive amounts of data, but our decisions aren't getting that much better. So kind of, if you look at decision makers of today, they aren't significantly better than decision makers from a century or two centuries or 2000 years ago. They're marginally better. So what we asked ourselves is, okay, we are drowning in data and insight. Why are decisions not getting better? And one of the problems we identify is, well, first, people are way, way overwhelmed. Uh, business leaders are overwhelmed. Executives are overwhelmed. Even though we now have a lot of IT systems that can put data in front of you, it's, it's just noise. So how do you cut through that noise and get to the signal that helps you make the best decision? And that's kind of the core of the book. So it doesn't start from, from the data itself, but it starts from the single question, how to make a better strategic decision. At the core of the book is basically helping you analyze specific data sets. So if you want to make the best possible decision, being for introducing new product, a new membership tier, whatever, you need access to four specific data sets. So one is customer data. That's what we just discussed. So if, if you're looking into customer experience in this specific way that we just discussed, you will be well positioned. But that's not enough. The second one is operational data. That's something that every company is familiar with. So for membership organization, that would be number of members we have, number of people that have renewed their membership, uh, what's the churn rate, uh, what is kind of the operating expense, all this boring stuff, how the company is running in numbers. Then the third data set is internal expertise or internal know-how. There's a big, big, big misunderstanding, especially in SMEs and larger organizations. If you're a 100 or 100,000 person company and Bruno or Zoe work in it, you cannot say that the company knows what Bruno and Zoe knows unless everybody in the company has access to Bruno or Zoe. So I might be the innovation expert, but if people in the company cannot access my expertise and I cannot help them, then the company cannot say we are innovation experts. And another thing that often happens, even though I live from consulting and working with large organizations, I always say your employees are best source of intelligence. So you don't always need to start from, hey, let's hire a PR company or external consultancy company to figure out what the customer wants or what we know. <laughs> Just ask your frontline people. They will have the hands-on experience. That person that's processing membership applications probably has a lot to comment on. It has probably heard a lot more than necessarily the board running the organization. So this kind of things. And the four data set, what we call the ecosystem data. The furthest companies usually go is they think about competition. Thinking about competition is good, but very limited because Companies usually think only about direct competition. So a trade association might think about another trade association in different geography or in a similar offering. Like what they will not think is about, hey, if my customer wants access to network, what are the other ways they're getting that access to? They might be using LinkedIn. Facebook, meetups, they might be going to a local bakery and, uh, you know, asking people, are you a welder? Can I hang out with you? I mean, it's, it's a horrible example, but it, it shows you what's happening out there. People satisfy their needs in very, very different ways. So that's why it's important to look at the broader ecosystem of a specific business or context, et cetera. All these four data sets together, even if it's imperfect and impartial data will help you make the best possible decision. You know, it might not uh, result in total victory at the end, but you will sleep well because you knew you made the best possible decision with what you had. Nobody has a crystal ball. 
or if you have it, please let me know. I'll try to buy it off you. But even though we don't have crystal balls, that doesn't mean that we, we cannot do the best we can to try to make the best possible decision, to make an informed decision. And that to me is, is a very important thing. And I'll pause here for a moment. I'm sorry, Zoe. I, I, I could go for hours on this. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fascinating. So, I mean, if people are already overwhelmed and then we've got four types of data and so much data, is there a way of filtering that data? Do you explain that in the book? Uh, yes. I love the word you use. That's the word I like using as well. Filter. The filter is always the outcome or the intent you have, the strategic intent. So if, if we start from the point we want to introduce new membership tier for that specific group of members. That's your filter. Then start working out, okay, that's what we're thinking about. So what type of data do we need to make the best possible decision? Oh, we need to see, you know, if anyone has any similar membership that's operational data, how have they been behaving? Do we have any surveys or questionnaires or interviews we did? That's the customer experience data. Looking at ecosystem data, has anyone done something similar? with this type of membership tier? How did it go for them right now? Is there anything out there that actually does the same thing but isn't a trade association? So that would be the intent becomes the filter itself. So you're not trying to, you know, um, almost like a hamster, gather everything and then figure out what you can do with it. But instead you're, you're starting with the outcome or goal at the end and then you're working, what do I need? What do I need to get there? with the best possible decision. So that drives what, what kind of data you want to look at and it helps you avoid that overwhelm. What it doesn't help you with is if you have a very murky understanding of what you want to do, then you need to clarify that. Yeah, I think that's a really, I'm like thumbs up and on board with your, your comment there. And I always talk about starting with the end in mind principle and it's a Stephen Covey principle and it's Stacey Barr uses that in her key performance indicator work where before you start trying to create a plan, you need to know the destination. And that's what people need to get clear on. Once you know that, that's a very helpful filter or lens through which to look at your data, to look at your decision-making set, to look at your strategic initiatives and so on. I want to ask a question around innovation and what COVID has delivered for us, this need to innovate our way of working. And for a lot of teams, this was, it was a big sort of back foot flip and having to do everything online through web conferencing, et cetera. And now companies are wrestling with how do we move forward? How do we innovate our mode of operating, which gives people flexibility? Now, some businesses are saying, not nah, everybody back in the office. The more sensitive, flexible ones are saying, there's got to be a hybrid model here. So some people work from home, some people will come into the office or individuals have a blend of both. How can we apply innovation mindset to this whole, how do we develop our work context? So what would be the steps that you suggest for that? Mm -hmm. So first I'll be speaking mostly uh, from Nordic perspective. And why I'm saying that is first in the Nordics, there is above average trust between regular employee and citizen and the uh, institutions which is important actually to a lot of questions related to hybrid work, because one of the things we can see in hybrid work that there's hesitancy from middle management because they feel if I don't see you, I can't control you. Can I just ask, Bruno, can I ask a good question about that? Why is that, like, why do you start with that? Like, why do you think it is that the Norwegians have such a strong faith in institutions? Well, it's historical, mostly. So kind of, uh, th this is a paraphrased story of Norway. So Norway used to be one of the poorest countries in Europe until they discovered oil. Uh, they were actually so poor that they couldn't extract oil. So first they, they went to Sweden, but Sweden uh, played a hard deal on them. So they had to go alone and start extracting it. They succeeded. That's what, where Norway is today. But they did a few genius things. They said, even though we found now a lot of oil and we are able to monetize it, we will put it all aside. A majority of that money is put aside in the biggest pension fund in the world. That's something called the oil fund. Officially, it's called Norwegian Pension Fund. It's, it's the biggest fund in the world. And what is happening, for example, in Norway, 
people don't have so much problems with the taxes because they can say, you see that school, you see that hospital. I mean, it's it's not all green and roses here, but people have much closer relationship to the institutions because they can see money from institutions being spent in their communities. And I, I make this comparison because I'm a Croatian coming from Croatia, which is on the opposite spectrum. There is distrust between the citizens and the actual institutions, which is stemming from, you know, Croatia's war for independence, the corruption that followed, etc. So it's kind of, it's a lot of historical background that goes into that. And, and the reason I, I kicked off with that is because to me, the question of hybrid work is the question of trust between management and employees. So yes, there is innovation in, in how the work is organized, how it's structured, etc. But I, I think there are some horrible inventions happening on right now. So you have software that can do full surveillance of your device. That to me is ridiculous. It's like putting a, a camera on employees, you know, shoulder and looking them, you know, go to the toilet and counting. Oh, you've been there uh, 90 seconds and you have 60 second break. It's dehumanizing to me. So that, that, that's why I kicked off with that, because I see this trust issue. And that is where innovation needs to happen. Like, how do we overcome trust issues? What lies at the root of these trust issues? Why, why do some managers have these issues with their employees? Why do they feel the need to monitor them at such level? How does that then translate to, you know, to bottom line performance and top line management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have answers. I'm just pointing out things. I was just waiting, like, what's the solution? Because everybody's asking. That. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, if, the, yeah. if the solution is be like Norway and drill for oil and put all the money into the bank to fund schools, and it's like, well, that's not helpful. <laughs> yeah, that, that's no, no, that's not the solution. There is another connected issue, and that is when people have perception that I'm paid for eight hours, then there's also peer pressure, you know, what, you, you want to work four hours? I don't see if you're actually doing the work. So what companies can do instead, obviously you can't go and copy Norway and I'm not suggesting that, but as all change initiatives start small, so instead of trying to change the whole company suddenly to one mode of work or to hybrid work or, or whatever, pick few teams or pick few divisions or sections and start with them. Always frame it as we are trying out this and be, be very how can I say, transparent. So the thing we are trying out is, I, I'm just imagining, not saying going to do it, like with this team, we are trying out a four day work week. They're still expected to deliver everything as if they were working for five days, but we are trying out if that will work. With this team, we are trying out flexible scheduling. So half of the team is allowed to be on premise. Half of the team is expected to be, I don't know, on Microsoft Teams or Zoom or, or whatever. So kind of you frame it all very transparently and experimenting around it. My suggestion is always, you know, measure the business performance. That's what should matter. Not, not if someone was in the office or online for seven and a half hours or whatever is the hourly schedule. So all of that. A lot of people, when, when they talk about hybrid work, they're focusing on cool things coming out, you know, Miro, Mural, uh, Zooms, uh, similar tools, etc. It's all cool tech, but the challenges with hybrid work aren't necessarily in the tech. But in what we consider work, what we reward, and how we pay for it. And those are the things where we really need to see some cool innovations. And, well, there are some happening, but not as much as uh, is needed to actually find out something. That was a very profound statement, Bruno. I think that's um, really something that we need to highlight. It's not about the tech. It's not even necessarily about the work structure. It's, it's more fundamental questions, right? Which is... What are we here to do as individuals, regardless of where we're working from and which methodology we're using? What is the result? Coming back to what we were saying before, like what's the destination? And when we have clarity around that and we're clear about how we're going to measure that, then measuring the inputs isn't as important as measuring the progress towards that end goal. So if people work two hours a day and they're getting us closer to that outcome, then that's awesome. And it shouldn't really matter whether it's two hours or eight hours. And I think you're right. Like punching clocks that came out of the industrial revolution, I think, where people were just cogs in the machine and 
they didn't use other capabilities apart from their bodies to be hands-on maneuvering things. The reinvention of work, I think, is a really interesting innovation question. So if you were tackling it through an innovation lens, how do we start reinventing work? What kinds of questions would you be asking? I think we already mentioned some of the questions, which are great. Like, okay, what are we here actually for what are we trying to achieve? And of course, uh, what, what we're discussing is there are different types of work. So knowledge worker isn't in the same position as service worker, who isn't in the same position as manufacturing worker. So we need to realize in what type of business are we? And that is what I would suggest as a first question, even though it sounds quite obvious, but I often start both innovation and strategy work is what's actually your business? Can you tell me? Like, I'm, I'm just... I'm just a consultant who came into your work. Can you tell me what's, what business are you in? And uh, that there is a great example uh, from, from Stephen Bungay, uh, which I always love. It's kind of, uh, th- there was an executive who was really annoyed because the rest of the management group uh, had a strong disagreement on what type of business they were in. So his position was that they're not in the business of making and selling heating units to end consumers, but that they're in the business of making and selling heating units to handymen. Because no one goes to the store and asks, I want to buy a boiler. They ask their handyman, <laughs> what, what, what boiler do I need to get? And then they tell them, you need to get that and that model. So those two are two subtly different, but significantly different business models. Because if you're selling to the handyman, you need to have manuals, you need to have customer line that's accessible to them, you need to have replacement equipment, you need to have uh, easy to use installation equipment. While you're selling to the end consumer, you would be focusing more on the benefits, you know, oh, this is going to heat your home in that and that way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that is an important question. What type of business are we in? And what is value in our business? What is it that makes the customer tick? From there, we can start figuring out how can we deliver that? Is it possible to deliver it differently? If you go to the cafe, server is part of it. It doesn't make sense to try to eliminate server, or at least in in my worldview, it, it wouldn't make sense to try to eliminate server with, I don't know, some robot with a face. Because part of human interaction and that atmosphere is what you go for, you know, in the French cafe or Italian cafe or something like that. So it doesn't make sense. But if I look at the knowledge work and we say we want to introduce new product or something by specific time, if you can do that in two hours, four hours, who cares? If it's done, it's done. So that's why it's important to start talking. What business are we in? What's actually the value? And how is it delivered? So kind of thinking about the operating model and challenge, it, it's basically challenging how the whole operation works. And what, what I'm proposing is, I use the word challenge. Now I regret it because <laughs> we, are even, we are even at the stage before that. And that is visualize, kind of really, really visually understand what is your business? How does operations work? how is the value actually delivered? And I'm literally thinking about, you know, drawing things up. If you can draw a square, you can, <laughs> you can draw it. You, you don't need to be some uh, painter or something like that. And that is such a powerful approach, visualizing things, because it's easier on our brains. But more importantly, when we visual things, we can make new connections, we can make new insight, and we can make new decisions based on the data we already have. It's, it's all data. Like all of that is a specific form of data. And I'll pause here for a moment. That was awesome. Uh, I think that's really incredibly valuable. And I think those are wonderful questions for leaders to consider when they're having this conversation around hybrid, remote, virtual teams, like uh, how do we do it? And coming back to those fundamentals about, you know, what kind of business are we in? What is the value that we're trying to offer? It's playing the end game first and then working out how to get there, which is the structure of hybrid and virtual is it becomes less of a big obstacle. I think the trust issue is, is still a big one. And I, for me, it's about knowing what the outcomes are and creating the relationships around being able to have conversations that are we delivering on this or not? Do we have a way of measuring progress? It's what you're reporting on. Like reporting on outcomes and progress is much better than reporting on hours spent. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you could be eight hours in front of your computer on Facebook, or you could be two hours on your computer coming up with a brilliant service that your customers are dying to have. 
Um, Bruno, this has been incredibly fascinating and fabulous. I'm excited about your book, which is looking at all the sorts of different types of data. You, that's not your first book, though, is it? You have another one at least, I think. Is that right? This is the first published book. What I have is an uh, ebook that's freely available that goes uh, more into nine big don'ts of corporate innovation. So I focused on innovation mistakes that are very costly to organizations and how to avoid them. Okay. And where can people get that? So uh, the book is freely available on my website, www.pesec.no. And what I always say, I mean, obviously to anyone listening, Zoe has my contact. You can always reach out to her and uh, she can help you. And maybe in the show notes. Yeah, we'll definitely put the link into the show notes. And uh, you can, you're on LinkedIn as well. So people can hook up with you on LinkedIn. Absolutely. Absolutely. Always happy to chat with people. Bruna, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been absolutely fantastic. I've enjoyed our conversation so much. Me too. Thank you for having me. I absolutely loved Bruno's energy. What a fun conversation. He has such a rich and deep experience in the field of innovation and working with organizations to ask really poignant questions about what our customers really want and diving into getting that information so we can make better decisions. So the key takeaway from me is to make better decisions with better data. And before you go scrounging around looking at all your data, your customer data, your operational data, your internal expertise, and your ecosystem of your data, is to make sure you have a clear filter around that. So what is the end game? What is the result that you're trying to produce? And to use that to look at all your data. So that's my key takeaway. In terms of team tips and what's useful for us around hybrid and virtual and remote working is to start with the end in mind and to ask, you know, what kind of business are we? Who do we serve? What are the results that we're trying to produce? So always it comes back to that key principle, start with the end in mind. Once we know that, we can create some measures. And once we have those measures, then we can start to talk about how are we going to deliver this and how does that work in the context of where people are going to be working, how they're going to be communicating, how they're going to actually be delivering those results. It's a much better place to start than how do we trust people if they're working from home? Don't you think? (laughs) I think so. Well, if you enjoyed the show, feel free to leave us a review or a recommendation or share the episode. That always helps boost listenership. Why do we want to boost listenership? Because the world needs better leaders. We've had so many crises over the last couple of years, and it's only good leadership that's going to help us survive and thrive through it all. And so my mission is to help people improve their leadership little bit by little bit with interviews like this, with thoughts like this. And you can play your part by sharing something that is useful from the conversations with others. If you're looking for a community of like-minded peers to accelerate your leadership development, then consider Amplifiers. It's my advanced leadership training program for CEOs, managing directors, and senior executives from across different sectors. And you can join in from wherever you live because we have a remote training virtual platform. So you can have a community of peers from around the world that you can use as a sounding board to benchmark against some of the issues that you've got and to get ideas as well as just feel like you're not alone because leadership, let's face it, is a tough gig. Well, I'm here for you. And thank you so much for listening in. I'd really do appreciate being in your ears each and every week. If you're new to the show, welcome. If you're a return listener, thank you so much for being a loyal listener. It makes doing this work so much worth it when you know that people are getting value from it. So in the meantime, live well, lead well. You've been listening to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast with leadership expert Zoe Routh. For more about people stuff and to contact Zoe, go to zoerouth.com.au.